Why is this the best fish and chips recipe? Because a great British chef who is a perfectionist, him and his team developed a few tricks that make this batter so perfect and so crispy that most people universally can agree that this is the best batter for fish and chips. The recipe yields crispy chips and a perfect extra crispy fried fish. So let's just jump right into it. The chips take the longest to make, so we're gonna start with those first. Now this is a three-step cooking process for the potatoes, a thrice-cooked fry. The problem with french fries is moisture, and double frying has inconsistent results because the amount of moisture in potatoes varies. The best potatoes that Heston found were Aaron Victory or Maris Piper. Never seen either of those in any supermarket in America. So I'm using russet potatoes, they will work just fine. And what I do is I feel them. I wanna make sure they're not soft and soggy. It's a lot of moisture in those. They're not gonna crisp up as easier as a harder potato. We want as little moisture content as possible. So a nice hard one, it's gonna be a good starting point. So to cut the chips, take the top and the bottom off. It's gonna create really just some flat angles. You don't have to trim the edges like this, but I find it just makes cutting the fries a little bit easier. I'm going for about three quarters of an inch thick slices for these fries. I find it's a great size for making fries at home, especially when making traditional chips. They're a little bit bigger. Toss those into some cold water and rinse that starch off. Now we just wanna run these under cold water for a few minutes to rinse off any excess starch until the water runs clear. Do that a few times, then fill up with fresh water, get that onto a stove, and bring that up to a boil with some salt. I don't want a rolling boil. That's gonna potentially break up the potatoes before they get a chance to cook through properly. I wanna take the potatoes right up until the point where they start to fall apart. If the potatoes break up and crumble, then you've overcooked them. If they're still raw and hard in the middle, you've got a little bit further to go. But if they do break in, into two smaller pieces, that's fine, that's actually a more traditional chip shape. Now we just wanna carefully fish out the chips and then let them air dry and cool. These are the visual cues you're looking for before popping it in the refrigerator. Those little cracks and crevices along the edges, those are just gonna get more pronounced as they cool. So once your french fries are at this stage, you pop them in the refrigerator and we're gonna cool them down completely, maybe 30 minutes to an hour, and then they're ready for their first fry. Now today I went to the farmer's market and picked up this beautiful cod. Any flaky white fish is generally going to work for this, but I actually do like cod. It's a very mild fish, and this was caught off the coast of Montauk. So super fresh, we need to portion it. Now I actually got yelled at on Instagram with some test recipes on fish and chips, and I got told that my piece of fish wasn't big enough. I don't think that's a valid concern. I like to not eat so much, especially fried foods, so I would like to make them a little smaller, but you make them as big as you want. This looks like it's gonna be a nice piece right here. Now that because this is a little bigger, I'm just gonna sort of go at an angle. And we just wanna get these seasoned with salt. Now these are gonna go into the refrigerator. They're gonna sort of firm up a little bit. We'll come back to these later. Oh yeah. You sort of see how it's like, almost looks like Parmesan cheese. These little white spots and this craggly edge, that's what you wanna see. Firmed up, not so delicate anymore. These are ready to fry. These little breaks and these edges in the potatoes, if you get them nice and dry enough, they're gonna create the extra crispiness that we want in these french fries. The first fry we're going for a temperature of 270. 270 Fahrenheit to be exact. I'm just gonna fill this Dutch oven with oil a little below halfway, so we have a safe amount of oil in the pot. Once it's up to 270 degrees, I'm gonna gently start to place in the potatoes. I would say that I pushed it a little bit. I would do one potato at a time. My fries turned out fine, but in my experience, the smaller the batch, the better the fry comes out. And we just wanna fry them until the fries begin to start to brown around the edges. Once you see that browning start to happen around the edges, that's a good time to kind of pull them out of the oil and we're gonna let them dry a second time in the refrigerator. So we've got our fries, they're gonna go back in the refrigerator and dry out for an one last time. At this point, what you could do is like cover them up, seal them up, 
and just store them, freeze them, and then they're ready to just throw in the fryer at any time. This is like the stage in a restaurant, they would take the fries up till prep, and when an order came through, they would just drop them and then they'd be perfect. I'm just gonna go in and let them air dry one last time so they're as dry as possible and we get them as crispy as we can. Now let's talk about the batter. What's so special about this batter? Why is this batter so great? Well, Heston is quite a perfectionist, so he and his team sought out to make the crispiest batter possible, working with National Starch, a starch company, to find the best combination of starches that work. And usually a batter is just starch and water, but he thought he knows vodka and alcohol evaporates much faster and with less energy than water does. He thought maybe if I replace some of the water with vodka, he might get a crispier batter, and he did. That quick Evaporation leaves air bubbles left in the space that the vodka used to be in the batter. That sort of creates this really beautiful crispy batter. And when somebody has gone great lengths to figure out something to perfection, who would I be to come and screw that up? So we're just gonna follow his directions for the batter. Now we're gonna use a scale. I'm gonna leave his full recipe down in the description. We're using two flours, a rice flour and an all-purpose flour. The rice flour has very little gluten, Gluten comes from the all-purpose flour. The combination of the two and the rice flour creates a crispy batter that you cannot get with just all-purpose flour. So he has 200 grams of each. So basically equal parts rice flour to all-purpose flour. A teaspoon of baking powder. Salt, a couple pinches. A tablespoon of honey for color. 300 milliliters of vodka. And this is the secret. 300 milliliters of a cold Pilsner, which is just about a whole beer. Then like a pancake batter, you wanna combine this until it just comes together. A few lumps are okay. And one extra thing Heston does is he runs it through a siphon with a CO2 charge to impart more air bubbles, but for the home, we can omit that. But now we're just gonna keep this cool until we're ready to fry. All right, now let's do the tartar sauce. Now a lot of you ask me why I might not make my own mayo from scratch after I did a video about it and there's a few reasons. Maybe I don't have as much egg and I wanna eat the egg rather than use the egg yolk to make this. Maybe I don't have enough oil to make it and I wanna use the oil for something else or maybe it's really expensive oil. So that's why I always have mayo on hand. Use whatever you want. But for a basic tartar sauce, we're gonna need about, call it about a cup. Is that exactly a cup? I don't know. Just go with me. Some Dijon mustard. Let's call it a nice tablespoon. Going with a little bit of malt vinegar. A little lemon zest. A little teaspoon of lemon juice, or a little cheek. A little salt, not too much, because we're adding a lot of salty stuff. Black pepper. I really want the smallest amount of an onion. Or maybe something that size. Let's call it a tablespoon or two of diced onion. I wanna cut it as fine as I possibly can. Get this fine mince in there. The texture is important to me, that size, that really fine size of onion. I really want it small. We're gonna do a similar thing with, uh, let's call it two gherkins, two to three gherkins, portion of a large one if you have, whatever you have, but some sort of pickle. I'm gonna cut it into three, like that, and then into little strips. Then into a fine dice, the same as the onion and approximately the same amount as the onion. I hate these stupid caper bottles. It's like no real good way to kind of maneuver through them. So I just want about the same amount of capers as I have onion and pickles. Give it a rough chop and add it to the mix. Throw those capers in and I like a little half teaspoon, little touch of the caper juice. Pickle juice is good too. Think about it, why does a tartar sauce work? You have that fatty, rich piece of fish and fries. This is acidic and punchy and all these things are like a pickle or some sort of version of a pickle or vinegar or lemon juice. So it's gonna cut the fat and balance everything out. That's why tartar sauce works. Now you don't need to add this, but I saw some at the market this morning. So I'm just gonna add a few chives. I think I'll save a little bit for garnish. 
And then we just want to give it a good mix. I taste a little bit of that onion sort of leaching out its onion juices and flavoring the whole thing. The crunch of the pickle and the caper, everything's starting to come together, but it needs a little time. So we're gonna put it in the refrigerator until we're ready to use it. All right, so we've got our fish here. I think we're ready to fry. I'm just gonna pop the heat on, get our oil up to 350, dredge these up real quick, then batter them, then fry them. Our fries, as you can see, they firmed up a little bit. They're dry. They've got nice craggly edges. No moisture, they're not soggy. They're gonna be perfect chips. These we're gonna to wanna to fry at around closer to 370. But first we're gonna fry the fish, that's gonna take the longest. Then we're gonna drop the fries and it's all gonna to come together at once. So I'm just gonna dredge that fish in a little bit of that flour. I'm gonna bring that oil temperature up to about 350 and you wanna get out your batter, which should be a lot smoother and a bit more hydrated by now. Drop your fish into the batter, get it fully coated, and then carefully drop that into the oil. Let the piece of fish fry for a second in the oil, and then with a spoon, drizzle a tad a bit more of that batter right atop the fish. That's a little tempura trick that Heston picked up that provides some next level texture. Now you're gonna see a lot of this rapid bubbling, and that's that vodka quickly evaporating, which is what we want. Might, you might find some excess batter that's now floating on top of the oil. You can just fish that out and let that fish cook until it's beautifully browned and crispy all around. Make sure the oil is the right temperature. If it's too high and you're fish is too thick, the batter might brown before the fish fully cooks through. Once it's cooked, transfer to a wire rack to cool and repeat with the rest of the fish. Now this is kind of a big piece of fish, so you really want to be gentle when you place it into the oil. I find the trick to this frayed crispy top is by spooning a little bit of that batter rapidly back and forth across the top of the fish. And it sort of creates this like mohawk on top of the fish of extra crispy batter that I love. Once the fish is beautifully browned and crispy, let it cool on a wire rack, and then you're gonna wanna drop the chips down for their final cook. We just wanna cook these until they're browned and crispy. Again, I push the limit with the amount that I fried at once. Always remember, smaller batches are gonna fry much better for you. Once everything's cooked, season everything up nicely and then get your tartar sauce out and get ready to plate. It's a restaurant in New York City called Dame that serves a variation of the Heston batter. And the brilliant ad that they did is they put the malt vinegar in a squirt bottle. So you get the flavor, but you don't drench it in vinegar. I love it. Just an incredible crunch. Mind you, this is a good 20 minutes after this came out of the fryer. Stays together the whole time, which is exactly what you want. Recipes down below. That's all I got today. See you next time. Until then, take care of yourself and go feed yourself. If you like this video, I got more videos that are just perfect for the summer right now that you gotta check out. If you like what you see on the screen, like this pulled pork video I just did, click through, you really gotta give it a shot.